Hello everybody, you're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound, I'm your host Dane Cobain. This is the weekly show where we chat about the local arts news, we have a different guest on each week, we play some local unsigned and or indie music, we head over to the Rye Light Zone for some poetry and or some fiction, and we have a weekly album review from Twangling Jack Ford over in the Ilk Shed. As always, you can find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound, you can email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk, that's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk I particularly want to hear from poets, performers, musicians, anybody with stories to share, arts, news, anyone who thinks they'd be a good guest for an interview and also anybody who has mp3s to share. You can also listen again, we're repeated on Monday nights on Wickham Sound, we're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again and we're on iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. So we're going to go straight into the Rye Light Zone for this week's reading and this is some of my poetry called Broken Glass After Closing Time. This is from one of my books, Eyes Like Lighthouse is when the boats come home you can find it on Amazon if you'd like broken glass after closing time broken glass after closing time a rare moment of solitude when you're surrounded by sound and there are people all around and they're howling for a little piece of you and you're dying for some peace and quiet but the lights are down low and the show must go on and you're so damn tired that the stage is on fire that's when you're alone you're really alone and so you stare at your phone and you groan because you have no new messages and 17 saved messages to listen to saved messages press one and then you're surrounded once more and you fall to the floor with your poor thoughts calling and every moment of silence has impeccable timing and you might just think of me again telling Carla she's beautiful. She's all the good times and the bad times and the times I lay awake at night and thought of where she was, what she was doing and whether she thought of me like I thought of her. She's the all-time greatest, most bodacious ancient with a facelift, prints lifted from fingers and lingering incense met my interest, princess. You know, she don't eat meat and feel free to disagree but that's a part of me. She got the hopes and dreams but her self-esteem needs an increase. She needs me to be me so she can see her divinity. Oh God, I believe in her more than anyone. She's a rare flower growing amongst the weeds. songbird in a cage living the dream if you want to live the dream you got to seize it like when your weed dealer needs to read your new release and you get back from birmingham with three signed books and a dozen new connections who mention you on social networks experts in their niches giving you peace of mind and side memorabilia to share with your readers the thought leaders who see the reason for reading fiction the contradiction between romance and horror creeping easily into other genres which can't return the favor and we savor the day we came together full of clever incentives like author bingo where you could win a kindle if you mingled with every single individual the residual build-up of interesting people if you want to live the dream go back in time in Birmingham sad poems I wrote a poem about how much I miss her it was a sad poem a fact that passed me by because most of my poems are sad I'm not sure if she liked the poem but the thing is I'm gonna write sad poems again and again and again whether she likes it or not but it's okay because I also do happy and she makes me happy when she's around this poem is a happy poem and this one's for her She won't leave. She just laughs and her hands clap in raptured. Seven little words she slept beside in silence. Sibilant vigilantes still envisioning zero emissions. So she sat down and scrolled the screen with her fingernail. She won't leave the Rolling Stones alone. She's been shown the long road home, but she refuses to walk it alone. She took her ticket and tore the sides of it so she knew it was no longer valid. Keep the faith. Everything is terrible and I'm dreading the inevitable tension when I mention condescension, the lack of respect and the disdain I collect for the people we elect as representatives, senseless centres of excellence rendered helpless. The footnotes of history books were made for men like me who were born early and blessed with a blend of graft and greatness, but I hate this life at times and we all do. Now I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer or to clown around with a Glasgow frown causing trouble in smoking bubbles like the struggles we face on a daily basis, but you've got to keep the faith if you want to win this race and I hate the fates that make me late the mistakes I made along the way and the way I changed and stayed the same for the weekend when you walk through town down the high street and it's light outside because the darkness died and you're alive again and the market stores crowd with a thousand lives casually interlinked and never seven steps from Kevin Bacon Jamaican flags making me crazy like reggae songs at blues jams brushing hands for a split second and then bang and the dirt has gone When you're surrounded by sound so loud you see colours, drunk as ringside and excited, the captain's casual crowd control throwing chocolate gold in a sleeper hold, slam faster than that like a heart attack and there'll be no rest for the wicked in Wickham. We come alive in the night time when the stars shine bright and they lower house lights and everything's fine and I feel alright just knowing my friends are behind me. 
The words melt on your tongue. And they taste like pistachio ice cream. The words that pass between us and take on new meanings. Like the sound of my name when you say it and give me butterflies. And I feel alive but a part of me dies when we say goodbye. Truth is, I'm just a fraudster and a charlatan. The words are just words that fade away and get forgotten. But you gotta start at the bottom and claw your way up. And you know this because you're on the rise too. The words melt on your tongue like a single snowflake in the summer until all that's left is silence. Madness. We are on a fast dash to madness, a quick descent into incoherence, the penance we share with the people we care about. Maybe I'm crazy and maybe I'm fading away in a burst of flame or maybe I'm here to serve a purpose, perverted and hurt and if you can't come first then I try not to enter the race. I got one thing on my mind because it's my time to shine and it's not a crime to try to find her, to design one line to change her mind and make her mine and now I'm crying. Look, there's something about the warmth of the sun which reminds me of the way she looks at me but when you play with fire you'd better be ready for fireworks. Checking for ghosts. Although we may just be checking for crackheads, even though that crackhead is actually but whatever floats your boat. I don't care what drugs you take, if any, as long as you're not I just said in a poem, so perhaps I'm too. Either way, we're checking for ghosts and crackheads, roaming from empty room to empty room, using hockey sticks as offensive weapons, which I forgot to mention. And the tension is electric and mental, and there's an accidental second when the tigers come out to play again. These are the moments we live for every single day the rain and the crackhead who's actually the only ghosts around here are in our heads all right that was broken glass after closing time some poems by myself dane cobain you're listening to the art show on 106.6 fm wickham sound and this is anyone we know by the anti-poet Company of sirens and a splash of flashing blue. We had to pull over to the side to let the ambulance go through. There was a smell of rubber burning and a taste of acrid smoke. We could hear some people screaming, they say you to invoke. We saw the panic on their faces and the terror in their eyes. There had to have been a few fatalities from that we could surmise. And then a fire engine passed us, the police not far behind. And while we still couldn't see the Accident, there was one thought on our mind. We hope it isn't anyone we know. We hope it isn't anyone we know. Oh, we hope it isn't anyone we know. Our sympathies are with you, it's not a pleasant way to go. And we hope that the relief fetched on our faces doesn't show. The earth was quaking in Haiti And the walls came tumbling down Trapping people under rubble Now home's a shanty town A volcano was erupting And the air was choked and grey Turning people into statues As the ash rained on Pompeii As the tsunami hit Sri Lanka The West professed dismay While we watched it on the telly Saw the people wash away But from disaster to disaster To apocalypse we find That while we're happy to donate there is that one thing on our mind at least it isn't anyone we know at least it isn't anyone we know <laughs> oh, at least it isn't anyone we know our charity is with you we'll do a benefit show we're just glad it's not for anyone we know Under the pier, I'll meet you here on Saturday lunchtimes in technicolours and rainbows. There were four of us that day, walking along Bottle Alley. I'd touch shards of saffron-coloured glass pressed into the bleached concrete and I'd wonder what comes in yellow bottles. Kerry balanced along the ledge like a gymnast on a beam, her wild gold hair trapped in the corners of her mouth. Claire wore thick mascara in turquoise and royal blue. Her eyelashes were insects, blue bottles and beetles' legs. Becky was tall and gangly. We talked about suicide. And we believed 1987 was going to be just like 1967. As we swigged from the Thunderbirds red, 50 pence more expensive than the blue, but we were all sick of scrumpy, hey? 
The four of us sheltered there from the rain and the boys and our parents. It was our secret place, that nook and ledge. With our backs against the seawall, our voices drowned out by the crashing of waves, a wash of froth and brine, an echo of footsteps across the soft rotting wood of the boardwalk above us. There were gaps between the planks, prisms of watery light, brown broken pipes emptied in slurps of sewage, lightning flashed between the rusty barnacled legs of the dear old lady peer, and the magic mushrooms made the sea all blood and ink. We shared 10 B&H, bubblegum lip gloss smeared and slipped off the tip and the lip of the bottle, and we sang purple rain, memorised the words like a prayer, it never meant to cause you any trouble. We swore to be best friends forever, that our children would play together, one for all and all for one, forever and ever. And as the storm died, the rain stopped, and God was a solitary shaft of sunlight hitting the sea with a silver path to the horizon. Under the pier, I'll meet you here. That was Under the Pier by Selena Godden. Before that, we had Anyone We Know by The Anti-Poet. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And this is the part of the show where we usually head over to catch up with our guests. But this week, we are doing another Twanglin' Jack Ford uh, album review special. So over to Twanglin' Jack for some album reviews from the Oak Shed. Tristan Untisalter, Richard Wagner. Wagner wrote long operas. I once stayed in for four Saturday nights in a row to watch the whole of the ring cycle. Approximately eight hours, it certainly had its moments, but nothing to eclipse the finale to Tristan and his Isolde. And in my opinion, nothing has ever eclipsed the climax to Tristan and his Isolde. Not even Springsteen's Broken Heroes on a last chance power drive. Wagner's trademark was suspended chords, which he used even more often than Pete Townsend. But unlike passages like the intro to Pinball Wizard, Wagner kept the suspension going, giving everything an unresolved uneasiness. Tristan and his Psalter famously starts with what has become known as the Tristan chord, a suspended chord that does not resolve till the end of the opera. For this reason, it is regarded as being very important and influential in the development of music in the following century. Wagner was a man who could write music that could make you feel exactly how he wanted you to feel. And often that feeling he was going for was nationalistic, though not every listener feels the need to invade Poland. He could write memorable riffs like Ride of the Valkyries, and he could write love like no other human being ever has done. Some might say the music is stirring, but stirring is how you sweeten tea. This is music to fire up whole nations with a passion to rule the world and to fire up lovers to recklessly devour each other in an everlasting kiss. Wagner was not a nice man in so many ways, but especially in his anti-Semitism. However, many Jewish performers consider the music to be too important to be ignored. The famously gay and Jewish comedian Stephen Fry is a massive fan And Wagner could do so much more than incite a yearning for a return to those halcyon days of legend. He could write weather and scenery. He knew the sounds of emotions, especially triumph and despair. I recently heard a librettist describe opera as an art form that strips away all the middle ground to a story, leaving only the peaks and troughs. The highlight and climax of the opera is their Liebestod, meaning love and death. It is the most famous and most successful musical setting of the action of lovers in the ultimate embrace. In this case, Tristan is already dead, but love is very much on the mind of his altar. Love as it should have been, and how she is seeing it, as she sings over his body, preparing for her own demise. She sings the main theme in ever-ascending variations. It twists and turns and soars in and out of flocks of fluttering counterpoint. Using just melody and rhythm, it builds and stalls and builds and stalls, each time leaving the music frustratingly unresolved, until the final thrust, in the fleeting moment of silence, the length of a fluttering heartbeat that forces a sharp intake of breath before the relief of the climax with the fading twilight of the gods' aftermath and the resolution of the Tristan chord. I have a shortened version of the opera and even that gets a bit boring. There are long instrumental passages where unresolved chords merge, but there are also moments of speedy, intense jaggedness that will have you on the edge of your seat. 
Really, I would recommend listening to just the Prelude and Liebestod, which you will find on most opera or Wagner compilations. There was a 1987 film called Aria, where famous film directors were asked to make music videos of pieces from opera, from which I would recommend Frank Rodden's Liebestod, starring Bridget Fonda as one of a pair of lovers pursuing a suicide pact in a Nevada motel. It is on YouTube. Wagner, Tristan and Isolde. The Bee Gees, their greatest hits. Sir Barry Allen Crompton Gibb is a local musician. He lives in Beaconsfield. Though he has claims to come from both Manchester and the Isle of Man, to people of my age he's one of the other guys in an Australian band who had a lead singer called Robin with big teeth who sang about a town in the USA. The idea that Robin was the leader was compounded by him having a solo hit single when they split a few years later. I had no particular feelings about the Bee Gees growing up. They were a band that appeared on shiny floor light entertainment shows. They mimed their instruments but there were a lot of strings playing. One of them married Lulu and when they stopped having hits they played the chicken in a basket circuit. I definitely didn't like them when they went disco, though it was not the beat but the falsetto vocals that put me off. It may not have been till I saw John Otway at Friars and Aylesbury sing To Love Somebody a cappella, with the crowd helping them along, that I realised what great songwriters they were. I had not realised I really liked their songs like Words, Got to Get a Message to You, World and Lonely Days, Lonely Nights, which is quite latter-day Beatles-ish, and I only remembered it when I listened to this CD. And there's Robin Saved by the Bell. They are famous for the disco hits, which are all on this album, and a lot of the songs that were covered by other artists like Dionne Warwick, Barbara Streisand, Yvonne Elliman, and Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton. It does not have the songs they wrote for Greece, nor does it have my favourite cover, Diana Ross's Chain Reaction. I am a sucker for key changes, and I love how that song changes key so often. This album also has the song of theirs that was a hit in Australia before they moved back to England. You can blame it all on the nights on Broadway and ask yourself, how can you mend a broken heart? But don't forget to remember the great songwriting talent of Barry, Robin and Maurice Gibb. The Bee Gees, their greatest hits. Dave Brubeck, Dave Brubeck's greatest hits. I posted on Facebook for suggestions of jazz to listen to and possibly to recommend and no one said Dave Brubeck. I was directed in his direction while watching clips of Bill Evans. If I was looking for jazz to play I would inevitably look for something with one of the iconic Blue Note covers. Serious looking men in serious sharp suits, wisps of smoke, subtle trails of sweat playing intricate horn riffs into the darkness that is more than just the lateness of the hour. The Dave Brubeck Quartet looked more like jazz professors, with those JFK stroke madmen thick-rimmed 60s glasses. A jazz novice might encounter numerous disparate types of music, all purporting to be jazz, and wonder what makes jazz jazz. A slightly facetious answer I once heard is that to a certain extent it is the number of Zeds. Queen can make an album called Jazz, but Bleeding Gums Murphy plays jazz. But really, jazz is about a syncopated swing rhythm, usually with tunes arranged using complex and interesting harmonies, and featuring improvisation. Dave Brubeck may not have had that many Zeds, but his music does tick all those boxes, it is not jazz rock or jazz funk, it is not really trad or bebop, it is just jazz, modern at the time with elements of classical music, but now it largely sounds like the epitome of jazz. In fact, one of Brubeck's best loved compositions, Blue Rondo a la Turk, works well as a determiner of jazz. Parts of it are a fast moving, exciting and intricate theme in 9-8 time, inspired by a Turkish rhythm pattern. And these seem to do battle with that 4-4 jazz swing thing, with the drum brushes and the ride cymbals. I just about remember when jazz musicians were pop stars. They appeared on TV light entertainment shows. 
The biggest star was Louis Armstrong, but you might get Count Basie on a Christmas special. The real pop stars in the UK were Kenny Ball and Acker Bilk. No Morecambe and Wise show was complete without their light-hearted, campy, camp-down races do da do da trad jazz thing. The Dave Brubeck Quartet became stars when they had a worldwide hit called Take Five, a jazz instrumental in 5-4, like Golden Brown. Brubeck liked unconventional time signatures. His other best-known piece, Unsquare Dance, also uses them. Unsquare Dance is a piece of music many will have heard, but even I did not know its title till I got this album. However, it is used frequently in arty black and white documentaries about art in the black and white days. As well as the three big hits, there are other Brubeck compositions and jazz arrangements of standards. Maybe an album for those who don't think they like jazz. Dave Brubeck, Dave Brubeck's Greatest Hits. The Long Road Home, a compilation of John Fogerty and Creedence Clearwater Revival songs. John Fogerty wrote Proud Mary. That alone would have made him a legend. He also wrote Bad Moon Rising, the song everyone can play, which makes it an open mic staple. He also wrote Have You Ever Seen the Rain and the Vietnam War protest song Fortunate Son. And after Creedence Clearwater Revival split, he wrote the song that opened Live Aid, rocking all over the world. Credence Clearwater Revival were a simple band making unrefined but very commercial music. They chugged away with a sound that people called Swamp Rock and they sang about the bayou even though they came from California. The singing is gruff but tuneful, the guitar is simple but exactly right. They are easy to copy yet there was no one else quite like them. For a very brief period, they were one of the top rock bands in the world. They made seven studio albums between 1968 and 1972, and all but the last one are loved by the fans. But I have never ventured further than listening to the greatest hits. Even though their best songs are some of the best songs ever, even on a greatest hits album, it all starts to sound a bit samey. The Long Road Home, a compilation of songs by John Fogerty and Credence Clearwater Revival. Cabaret, Candor and Ebb, Willkommen, Bienvenue, Welcome. Who could fail to be chilled by the fresh-faced handsome young boy singing a poetic folk song in a beer garden, only for the camera to pull out and as the song turns into a Nazi anthem, we see he is wearing a Hitler youth uniform. And when the song concludes with Tomorrow belongs to me. The crowd, dressed in lederhosen, with steins of beer, rapturously applaud, because that is how it happens. That is not the only occasion when they pull the rug from under your feet. If you could see her through my eyes, a charming and apparently innocent song, though sung to a woman in a gorilla suit, wraps up with a potent anti-Semitic statement when it finally reveals that what he sees through his eyes is that she does not look Jewish at all. If you thought Cabaret was just about sexy dancing with bowler hats, you have missed the point. It is about the rise of the Nazis. But it does have some great tunes, many of which are performed as part of a cabaret act, which is performed in the Kit Kat Club by Sally Bowles, a real-life Englishwoman, a CDMC and a chorus line of dancers. In some stage versions, the cast are made to look unsexy, unglamorous, and rather sad despite being semi-clad. Outside of the Kit Kat Club, Sally Bowles is defined by rebellious green nail polish, failed romances and an optimistic nature and so sings the showstopper Maybe This Time. To capture the feeling of pre-war Berlin, the music bows its head to Kurt Weill, especially in numbers like Mine Hair and Willkommen. There are different versions of Cabaret, some have the songs from the original stage show and some include songs from the film. The best known of these is Money Makes the World Go Around. I would recommend the film soundtrack or better still, watch the film which presents the dancers as sexy and glamorous, has Liza Minnelli in stockings, suspenders and high heels, making no attempt to sound English but giving the performance of her lifetime. 
and it has the added attraction of the iconic Bob Fosse choreography. And always remember that life is a cabaret, old chum. Cabaret, candor and ebb. Dr. John the Night Tripper, Gree Gree. Mac Rebernack, a noted session musician, took up the cloak and voodoo mask of his alter ego, Dr. John the Night Tripper, and announced his appearance with his satchel of Gree Gree to cure all ills, including having a troublesome woman. His music was a New Orleans gumbo, with psychedelic harpsichord and flute meeting up with abrasive female backing vocals and a swampy rhythm. The famous song on this album is Walk on Gilded Splinters. He carries the totem of the New Orleans greats, the swaggering walk of Fats Domino, the syncopation of the New Orleans funeral march going through the neighbourhood, and Armstrong's St. Louis Blues. He went on to be better known as an exponent of the New Orleans style of piano playing associated with Professor Longhair and for his warm, creamy, honey singing. He later had success with songs like Ico Ico and Right Place Wrong Time and appeared in the TV series Treme, which was about the music scene in post-Katrina New Orleans, made by the makers of The Wire. But Gree Gree was the right thing at the right time. If you had Zappa, Beefheart and even early Alice Cooper, you probably had Dr. John, the Night Tripper. True that. You're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Poet Terry with Chocolate Daddy. Chocolate Daddy. The body is fit, but the mind is flaky. What I'm trying to say is, she's no type of lady to have my baby. Black, colourful and swift. That's why some girls call me the gift. Because when I enter, I bring the presents in a flavour coated in cocoa and essence. Smooth, dark and slender. Chocolate daddy, done rich in your centre. Now that's what I call a chocolate bar with texture. Which melts in your mind, fulfilling your every desire. Stroking any fantasy in a daylight dream we call reality. Terry's all chocolate. The experience that melts in your mind. That was Chocolate Daddy by Poet Terry. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And we're going to go and catch up with Twanglin' Jack Ford again for some more album reviews from the Elk Shed. Over to Twanglin' Jack. Condeed, Leonard Bernstein. Condeed is Leonard Bernstein's flawed masterpiece, which keeps being revised, revamped and reimagined in attempts to perfect it. As a birthday present one year, I went to see Condeed at the National Theatre, starring Simon Russell Beale. It was genuinely funny, but you would expect it to be with one of the central characters always referring to only having one buttock. The music is clever and memorable. In places it backs up the humour, and in other places it is very moving. The problem people have with it is that it is a comic operetta that was written in the 1950s, in a style made popular in the 19th century by the likes of Gilbert and Sullivan, and is based on a comic novel written by a French philosopher in the 18th century. Condide is a satire written by Voltaire and follows the title character as he pursues Cunegonde, the love of his life. Along with the woman with only one buttock, a philosopher and several other repeating characters, they ludicrously cheat death like the 1960s Batman. They are repeatedly separated and reunited. They travel the world. They have massive successes and massive failures. Good luck and bad. And they come to the conclusion that they need to settle down and seek a simple way of life. So they end up in a rural idyll that they get a bit fed up with. The important character is the philosopher Professor Pangloss. And the philosophy he teaches is that everything is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. This is more usually attributed to this fictional philosopher than the real philosopher whose philosophy it actually was. Voltaire satirised it believing that the idea that everything that happens is the best thing that could have happened leads to unwarranted optimism and this leads to wars. The famous songs are Best of All Possible Worlds and The Grand Finale where Condide asks Cunegonde to marry him because they are neither pure nor wise nor good but they will do the best they know and build a house and chop the wood and watch the garden grow. This is the big choral finale with a perfect Bernstein melody. 
guaranteed to bring a lump to the throat and a mist to the eyes. The lyrics are pithy and witty. They were written by a number of humorous writers including Dorothy Parker and Stephen Sondheim. I recently watched a version on YouTube and it is funny, much funnier than a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. And it's the same version as this CD I have, Condeed, Leonard Bernstein. I'm a believer, the best of the monkeys. Mike Nesmith, Peter Talk, Mickey Dolins and Davy Jones were hired to perform as a fictional band in a TV show. Apparently they wanted the loving spoonful, but they were not available. Nesmith and Talk were musicians, and Dolins and Jones were actors. Dolins had been a child star on TV. I had watched him in Circus Boy. And Jones was from England, and had been in Oliver. The show's producers got top songwriters to write some of the best pop songs ever written, and the backing was mostly performed by top session players, so real songwriters wrote songs that were played by real musicians and sung by actors in a TV show. But there was a backlash that the monkeys were miming. What is curious was that it never pretended to be anything other than what it was. After all, the Beach Boys did not play the instruments on pet sounds. They were played, probably, by many of the players who played on the Monkees records. We now live in a world of boy bands and auto-tune, and the Monkees would be applauded just for the singing. Even before I learnt guitar, I was convinced that Mike was miming the right parts. Mike was my favourite. I was destined never to be the singer that got all the girls like Davy, but I did become a guitarist in a hat. And when I learnt Pleasant Valley Sunday, I was proved right about Mike's miming. For some like me, The Monkees was up there with Batman as one of my favourite mid-60s TV shows. When I heard that theme tune, Hey Hey We're The Monkees, and there they were with their surfboard, doing their monkeys walk, I would settle down for half hour of black and white TV fun. The TV show was initially criticised for copying The Beatles, but it went on to be innovative in its own right and has been repeated often over the years. It introduced Frank Zappa and Tim Buckley. It had songs about peace and love, and sometimes they wore caftans. On my 10th birthday, I was given the single of I'm a Believer, which I played constantly on my record player. And now I play it on guitar and keys, and I never get fed up with it. The B-side was the very garage rock sounding I'm not your stepping stone, and I must be the only guitarist of my ilk not to play it but I am open to offers. Any Monkeys compilation will be full of great songs performed brilliantly. Not only was there I'm a Believer, Pleasant Valley Sunday, I'm Not Your Stepping Stone and the Monkeys theme, but also Daydream Believer and Last Train to Clarksville. They started to write their own songs. The most successful of these was Dolenz's alternative title, memorable for having both scat singing and timpani. But there are other Talk and Nesmith songs of merit. They started performing as a group and for a few dates they hired the Jimi Hendrix Experience as their support act. They made a very strange film called Head, which is better regarded now than it was at the time. The Monkeys, a compilation of their best songs. The Flaming Lips Greatest Hits Volume 1 If you are looking for something that is a bit crazy but still makes some sense, Something that is on the verge of being anarchic but still holds itself together just enough to make it a compelling listen. Something that is funny without actually being comedy music. Something that touches bases with psychedelic rock music going right back to the 60s but is never nostalgic. Then you may be in need of the flaming lips. For me, almost the perfect rock ensemble. A bunch of guys from Oklahoma City who have been around since the 80s. Like R.E.M.'s weird arty dropout cousins, trying musical experiments which, like the best of David Bowie, often actually work. Their most famous song, Do You Realise, is a happy song about dying, and is performed live with dancers dressed as furry animals, while Wayne Coyne, the lead singer, walks across the audience in a big transparent bubble. Do you realise that everyone you know one day will die? And instead of saying all of your goodbyes, let them know you realise that time goes fast and you've got to make the good things last. 
and realise the sun does not go down, it's just the effect of the world spinning round. Lunacy and genius going hand in hand. This Greatest Hits triple CD is excellent value. I bought it even though I have more than half of it on other albums. But there is a favourite song of mine from their Soft Bulletin album that always played with distortion on that CD and plays perfectly on this. I also wanted to check out their earlier stuff and was delighted to find the song called She Don't Use Jelly, which is catchy, strange and funny. What more could you want? The Flaming Lips, Greatest Hits, Volume 1. Genesis Foxtrot. Early 70s prog rock is like my jealous ex-lover that creeps up on me when I'm not paying attention. I've never been much of a fan of the version of Genesis that was fronted by Peter Gabriel. There are only a handful of their songs I would choose to listen to, and then only rarely. But I have an almost pathological loathing of the post-Gabriel band. But I am a sucker for those sidelong prog epics of the early 70s, and I have great respect for the way they were played and recorded, with a very limited number of instruments on analogue tape. There were no polyphonic synthesizers. It was all Hammond organ, Fender Rhodes piano, and maybe some ARP or Moog synths. I found much of Genesis's early work to be quirky and meandering, leading to disappointing climaxes. When CDs became cheap or available in the library, I listened to stuff I'd not liked at the time, to see if my opinion had changed. If you listen to the Genesis live version of the musical box, you will see how disappointing the climax to the studio version on the Nursery Crime album is. That was the album prior to Foxtrot, which had cemented their status in the upper echelons of prog at the time. I went to a boys' grammar school. We were clever. We liked prog rock. Until the time came when it was clever not to like prog rock. Bands like Early Genesis liked to use simple chord progressions, with each chord being given differing uneven numbers of beats. This allowed the tatty blazered schoolboys of my desert boot wearing and gas mask carrying adolescence to claim to understand and marvel at the complexity of the time signatures. Watchers of the Skies, the opening song on Foxtrot, is one of my handful of OK Genesis songs. It uses the time signature thing to good effect, starting the album with what sounds like a sort of sixth form project to reimagine Mars from Hulse's Planet Suite but I probably was a sixth former when I first heard it. The song Supper's Ready is a 23 minute epic that was side two of the vinyl. The number of themes and ideas is not too overwhelming, so each one is given space to develop. I must admit, even on recent re-listening, I snobbishly scoffed at the amount of arpeggios, which I'd never would have done had it been a piece by Philip Glass. It moves through bucolic romantic balladry, and knock about musical nonsense a bit like the teddy bear's picnic, telling the story of a pair of lovers on a pilgrim's progress, mysterious figures on a lawn, one carrying a cross, a farmer and a mad scientist, mythical figures and a battle for peace and its hideous aftermath, through musical passages that genuinely build the tension. But the main reason it succeeds is that the climax it builds up to is quite genuinely spine chingling. The first time the climax theme appears as the guaranteed eternal sanctuary man, which whets your appetite for its grand reappearance with a great fanfare of pomp and glory and tubular bells with Bunyan and Milton-esque apocalyptic lyricism, where souls ignite and angels stand in the sun, and the lovers, one of whom had called out suppers ready in the opening section, were now being called to partake of a supper at the highest of tables with a king of king who leads the way to a new Jerusalem, like revelations according to Genesis, coming at the end of an apocalypse in 9-8 time. I find it both totally ludicrous and immensely moving, like Darley's crucifixion or Blake's Jerusalem. Please allow me to confess the sin of a guilty pleasure. The other songs are very much the other songs, though Genesis fans seem to also like Get Em Out By Friday. Foxtrot, Genesis. The Light at the End of the Tunnel, a compilation album by The Damned. 
It was sometime in 1976 when I saw the dams supporting the trogs at the roundhouse and I was not sure about the whole idea of punk. I could see the music was being led by the fashion and that was the wrong way round. The damned were like nothing I had ever seen. So fast yet so tight. Their version of the Beatles' help was stunning. They also had a menacing presence which made me feel a bit uncomfortable. There was a myth that punk was started by guys who had just picked up guitars and learnt three chords. But it was mostly guys in their late teens and early twenties who had been around a bit and adapted what they had been doing to be part of the new movement. And who could blame them? Punk is always fun to play. I was impressed by The Damned but not convinced. And then I heard their single, New Rose, the first punk single and to this day probably the best. The spoken intro made me laugh. Thunderous drums, heavy guitar riffs and a catchy chorus. It showed off their musical abilities and it also set them up as the jokers in the pack. A bit scary and having a laugh at the same time. They also made an album with some more great songs on it. I saw them at Friars in Aylesbury in the California Ballroom in Dunstable where they brought on Lowell Coxell, a moderately well-known avant-garde soprano sax player. There I was amongst the po-going throng, but when I saw them at the Roundhouse again with Motorhead as a support, I sat in the balcony and watched their weird pantomime of a show, with Captain Sensible wearing a ballet tutu. They made more great records, Smash It Up became an anthem and appeared on a Batman soundtrack. Someone at a record company gave me their album Strawberries and I was stunned by how competent they had become, how their songwriting had matured, but it ended for me with The Damned when I tried to put aside childish things and grow up. The Damned went goth and became my little brother's band and that is how I have this compilation double album covering all their best years. It was my little brother that got us tickets to see them at the White Horse on West Wickham Road. They played their hits, even the extravagant Eloise. It was a great night, but a bit sad that they were playing in a pub in Wickham, famous for strippers. The light at the end of the tunnel, the damned. Court of the Crimson King, King Crimson. Some say that Court of the Crimson King is the first prog album. When I was a lad, the term prog or progressive referred to any rock music not considered to be commercial pop. The term file under progressive was a suggestion to record shops, though I have never seen a progressive file. Genres were not really a thing before punk, after which the split was all about the old and the new. Virgin Records used to categorise the albums they listed for sale on the back of the Melody Maker as soft rock or hard rock. It was usual for rock fans to have albums by a broad selection of bands that would later come to be classified in different genres. I had Black Sabbath, yes, Led Zeppelin, and Simon and Garfunkel albums. I would listen to anything, anything but country. Court of the Crimson King launches with the absolutely timeless 21st century schizoid man, a monster of a riff and a distorted Greg Lake vocal famously sampled by Kanye West, bookending passages of almost free-form grunting saxophones and tightly arranged flurries of jazzy ensemble playing. The album is a mixture of the grandiose and pared down acoustic with mournful trilling flutes and ambient percussion. King Crimson became a vehicle for Robert Fripp and his guitar innovations, which he performed sitting down. He famously played an important part in the making of Bowie's Heroes. However, in the early days, it was his use of the Mellotron that filled up a lot of the space. The Mellotron is a keyboard that, when the keys are pressed, each key plays a tape of an instrument. Fripp was not a pioneer of the Mellotron. The Moody Blues were famous for it, especially on Nights in White Satin. And the Beatles used the flute sound on Strawberry Fields. There are two great Mellotron tracks on the album, the slightly epic epitaph, and the concluding and very epic title track, with its big melody, big production and big choir-like backing vocals. However, a large amount of the album is filled with a track that has not aged well, as you would expect from a song called Moonchild. Hippy trippy lyrics. It makes as much sense as incense. Time passes tediously, 
decorated by jazzy guitar intertwined with soft chime vibes and a bit of flute, exploring sonic textures, thankfully with a minimum of dissonance and harsh percussion. You could avoid this by listening to a compilation. The one I have has the key tracks, however the song Court of the Crimson King is edited, though that might not be a bad thing. And of course there is the famous cover, Court of the Crimson King, King Crimson. Big thank you to Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album reviews. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Wanted Men by Fella.
was Shimmer by John C. Buttigieg. Before that, we had Wanted Men by Fella. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain. This is the part of the show where we normally catch up with Twangling Jack Ford for a weekly album review. But as it's been the Twangling Jack Ford review special this week, we're going to skip that. Instead, I'm going to give you my regular reminder. Come find us on Facebook by searching for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. You can listen to us again if you miss an episode. We're repeated on Monday nights on Wickham Sound. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again. We're on iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. You can also email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. I'd love to hear from you. So I'm going to leave you with one last tune, and this is previous guest Robert Honor with Not A Cloud. I'll see you next week. Cloud in all the sky.